given, Georgina, that we heard two presentations, one from you, uh, one from Hussein Taubi about uh, the use of combination immunotherapy with brain metastases, which looked impressive, does the presence or absence of brain metastases play into your decision to either recommend combination or single agent therapy? I think now after the data to presented today, it does. Um, uh, we, admittingly, we, admittedly, we need more data and uh, larger numbers of patients, but so what we saw today from Hussein was, was a US study of the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients with asymptomatic uh, brain metastases was a response rate of around 55% in the brain and a six-month progression-free survival rate of 67%. It's early days. We don't have long follow-up. It's a medium follow-up of just over nine months. Uh, but impressive curves with a flattening of the progression-free survival curve. However, it is early days. What was great was this was followed by an Australian trial, completely separate, um, designed with a combination ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients with asymptomatic and completely untreated, no local therapy to the brain, who were randomized between the combination and nivolumab alone. And in that trial, when you took the drug treatment naive patients, so patients who did not get BRAF or MEK inhibitors, so very similar to the US study, you saw a very similar response rate with ipinevo of 50% and a progression-free survival of six months of 47%. This is more mature data with the median follow-up of 16 months, but again, the flattening of that progression-free survival curve. The difference between those two studies, however, was that in the Australian study, um, patients had a greater burden of brain disease. In fact, they had 50% of patients had more than four brain metastases, whereas in the US study, 20% had more than three brain metastases. So that may explain the slight difference in results, but really confirming one another that there is good activity. What's more, two facts. Low activity in patients who'd had previous BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Small numbers though, but still a hint there with only a response rate of 16% in the 12 patients who had had no uh, previous BRAF MEK, so one. Number two, the activity in nivolumab, and it was not powered to compare the two arms, but monotherapy did not seem to have as high a response rate with only 20% of patients responding in the brain. And then the third thing is there was a small cohort in the Australian study of patients had previous treatment, leptomeningeal disease, symptoms, and they did incredibly poorly with only a 6% response rate in the brain. So all of that data together speaks to using uh, immunotherapy firstly upfront, um, particularly the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. And then we come in with our local treatments if needed. I just want to make one other comment if I can, and that's about the deaths that occurred in the first 12 weeks in this patient population. So in the Australian study, we, were, we showed on our waterfalls that were quite a few deaths of patients in the first 12 weeks. That's not uncommon. That is expected in this patient population. You just never see it. People just don't show you their non-evaluable patients because they don't get to scan. That's a good point. So, so um, this is not uncommon in a population with a heavy burden of disease in the brain uh, with 50% more than four brain target. That's just target brain metastases. So all in all, uh, immunotherapy combination nevo ipi works well up front if it works the responses seem to be quite durable so mike you're an expert in the field yeah. very experienced would you forego stereotactic radiosurgery and put such a patient who's BRAF wild type with multiple brain mets directly on tippy nevo absolutely i mean i think the data was quite compelling the the other thing i also thought was quite striking about the two studies was actually the safety profile that you know it was one of the concerns with an agent that works by generating inflammation of would that actually cause problems in the brain and there really weren't much in the way of sort of brain specific toxicities that we saw with the therapy in either trial. And that again was one of the concerns about what the experience would be. So the fact that it was actually very well tolerated I think was another important result of both of the studies. Um, you know, I think that again, yeah, in terms of uh, patients with the, the multiple brain metastases, we know that um, the gamma knife can be, or the, the stereotactic radiosurgery can be effective at, at treating the brain metastases that we target. We know that those patients also have a very high risk of developing other brain metastases metastases, and certainly this is generally happening in the setting of patients who have multiple metastases and other organs in the body as well. Uh, and so the idea of having a highly effective therapy that can work quite quickly in the whole body, 
I, I think looks quite compelling. And, and, you know, this question of actually if it wasn't working, is there any chance that radiation therapy would rescue? Would you actually have some type of abscopal effect that could help, help you uh, if you needed it after the initial immunotherapy? I think is sort of another rationale of why maybe starting with the immune therapy. Okay, Robert. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, one, Jason? one point I wanted to bring back to again to get Mike's point. So Mike presented this data on Break MB about using BRAF, showing an outstanding response rate in BRAF mutant patients. So if you start now merging these sort of together, you really start to get to sequences of therapy that really should be optimized for patients. Because if we're seeing these great responses with BRAF in a multi, um, you know, multi metastatic uh, intracranial uh, situation, I mean, I think there really is a clear role there for debulking from a systemic therapy that maybe then transitioning to a therapy that has long-term benefit. You mean debulking with debrafenib trametinib? Yes, exactly. Not yeah. with radiation, yeah, but yeah. rather starting with okay. BRAF mech inhibition and then thinking about a transition point where you could then try to get that long-term. Okay, benefit. that's a great segue to another important question, which but is can you use BRAF mech inhibition to turn a cold tumor into a hot one. So let's hear from Jason and then let's hear from Robert, because this is also a surgically important question. Yeah. Can I just uh, make one point before you do? And just to make it clear, waiting until progression with BRAF mech, no. That's what our trial in Australia showed. So what, what Jason's talking about is a short course to debulk. So I just want to make that clear, because if you start DABTRAM and wait for progression, then go with immunotherapy, the data from Australia suggests that's not the strategy. So we're talking about a short course, right, Jason? Okay, so uh, that's yeah. kind of the dirty little secret. So Jeff, can I actually add, so and I, I think that also we have to distinguish this, so we're talking about extracranial or intracranial disease here. Because I think also your data that you presented, Georgina there, is that in the patients who had been treated with BRF mech combination, when you then gave them the niv niv nivolumab and nivolumab, the response rate was actually very poor in that. So to me, that would mean that in the brain, potentially, going with nivolumab and nivolumab first, even in the BRF BRAF mutant patients is probably a better method, and if you don't get a response with them, then add the BRAF mech combination for them. But I think we don't have the data, but I'm concerned in the brain that if you don't get the control that, that you, if you went with the BRAF mech first, you may not get the control you wish to have Correct. in the brain.